I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Red Brook and what we've done down there. So Red Brook was the property that Theodore Lyman bought up in the 1870s. He basically preserved the whole stream, uh, and it stayed in the family until 1990, when a deal was brokered to sell part of the land to Mass Fish and Wildlife, which created a trust uh, for the property, and it was called the Theodore Lyman property. And so 400 acres went to the state of Massachusetts as a wildlife uh, conservation area, and then 216 acres was donated to the trustees of the reservation. And uh, that's, that basically preserved the entire stream, but it opened it up for the first time to the public. And um, Red Brook had four small dams on it with uh, small ponds. They dated back to the time when uh, the stream was used for uh, cranberry cultivation. And um, from 2006 through 2009, there was a cooperative joint effort between the Division of Ecological Restoration, who Beth Lambert uh, work for, works for, and that's who Prudy was talking about, uh, 80 Meg Peace, uh, Trout Unlimited, American Rivers, <coughs> U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we had this, we had this big um, coalition of different uh, non NGOs, non-governmental groups, as well as uh, as government agencies to remove these dams and return the uh, co uh, connectivity to the stream. And removing these dams is no small work. All the heavy equipment here you see was uh, was from AD Make These. And they donated all of that. So that was about $50,000 in an in-kind donation uh, to the restoration of the stream. And here you see uh, a dam has just come out, and they're beginning to work on the other side. And then we're beginning to, to work to restore the stream. So where those two small maple trees were, uh, are, there was a dam right there. And then you can see what the stream looks like after we've done tree planting and revegetating along it. And uh, after all the dams were removed, one thing that we started doing was placing large woody debris in the stream and basically taking the stream back to what it looked like at the time of European contact because all these streams would have had trees growing along the edges of it. These trees fall over. And that's actually good for the stream because it creates a lot of complex habitat in the stream itself by causing scour holes and great cover for the trout and eels and, and other animals uh, to live in so, they're, uh, so they can avoid avian uh, predation. So this is kind of what it looked like after we did put in all the woody debris. And all that woody debris, the, the cost of putting all, all that in uh, was $20,000 and that came from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They gave us a grant for $20,000 to do that. And that was the end result. That's a, a Salter Brook Trout from Red Brook. Uh, it's about a 13 inch fish and uh, Again, it looks very different than the little brook trout you catch up in the mountains in, in the Berkshires or uh, where, they don't, where they can't get out to the marine environment. Um, the, another stream that has been restored recently here in Massachusetts is the Eel River in Plymouth. And this was basically one big cranberry bog here um, that underwent an extensive restoration starting in uh, 2008 and ending in 2010. So. There you see it in April, and this is what it looked like in August. And it's a pretty dramatic uh, recovery. Um, and uh, over time, you know, they're going to do some tree planting in there too. But it's pretty dramatic how quickly it can, it can, uh, it can vegetate itself. Um, this is another brook in Plymouth that underwent restoration. Uh, here you see the end of a very old fish ladder that didn't work very well. Um, that's, in, that's in 2001. And then over on the right hand, you see, you see 2002. Uh, that's a better view of it. And then in 2003 and 2004. So it doesn't really take long to vegetate the, the banks and uh, restore the habitat. I'll talk a little bit about your stream here, the Millbrook. Um, it's been altered quite a bit since the time of European contact. It, it really isn't anything like it was. And uh, particularly since 
the 1940s when they, when they put that new uh, culvert in down below. The problem now with Millbrook is, it's, as far as fish, fish, passage, fish passage goes, is it's entirely lost. You have six ponds on the Millbrook, and uh, it lacks upstream fish passage uh, completely. So if, if the town was to decide that they were to restore it, you'd have to address all six of those barriers. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to remove them all, but if you want to restore the connectivity to the stream, um, you'd have to address every single barrier. Uh, and, of course, there are a lot of social issues to that, too. I know that a lot of people in town are really, um, uh, they really love their, their mill pond. So that's a decision the town has to come to. But it does have a really cool, to use the vernacular, uh, connectivity potential. And um, I think when, when you look at this, it could have really good effects on the Great Pond as well. Uh, because now you have up in Town Cove up here, from what I understand, it's really silting in. And that's because there's no flushing going on in the system. If you remove the dam at, at uh, the mill pond, you'd create a flushing, uh, you'd have a, an event throughout the year where you're constantly flushing down the sediment, and all that sediment that's building up in Town Cove would be naturally pushed down into the Great Pond, just like it normally would in, in a stream that didn't have any barriers on it. Um, sustainability. You folks are all faced with a real issue uh, about financing the dredging of the pond. And the problem with dredging it is uh, th the barrier is still there, and you still have the same problem. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you know, you could spend a half million dollars or whatever to dredge it now, and in 30 years you're going to be faced with the same issues again. Whereas if you restore the stream's connectivity, then um, you're not, this issue goes away, and it would look much like the streams that you've seen restored in the other slides. Uh, you do have the, one big issue is the, the pond that you use for a water source for the fire department. Um, there are alternatives to that, but, uh, you know, that's, and, and actually in the site recon that uh, Prudy has, it talks a little bit about that. But that's an issue that the town's going to have to deal with one way or another if they decide to do a restoration of the stream. Um, the technical considerations are, you can see down here, this is your fish ladder. Uh, this, this fish ladder is not inoperable. It's not working properly at all. And um, <clears throat> if you were to either partially breach it or partially breach the dam or just put a big culvert under it or whatever, then this whole issue goes away and you'd have um, free up and down access for American eels, white perch, uh, sea run brook trout. There's a lot of different species that, uh, that would benefit. It's not only brook trout that benefit from st stream restoration, it's all these other species as well, along with blueback herring and, and uh, alewives. The social constraints are that the pond's always been there as long as everybody in the room has been here. So, as a community, you have to decide whether, uh, whether you want to restore the stream or keep the pond. So that's a, that's a very big social constraint, and I'm sure there are a lot of differing opinions in town. Uh, but at some point, you're going to have to come to a consensus, either to restore it or dredge. So, if you were interested in doing a stream restoration, these are the basic steps that you go through. Uh, to have it restored. And uh, a lot of the data collection uh, would go pretty quickly. And because there's already been a site recon done by the Division of Ecological Restoration, there's already kind of a template uh, for filling in all the blanks that data collection would give you. And um, basically, uh, you'd have to just decide whether this is the road you want to go down. Uh, and a big part of that is the cultural and historical uh, resource and, and surveys as a town come to an understanding of, you know, if you want to do this. Um, as far as funding goes, all these restoration projects that are going on in Massachusetts, 
Very little funding is coming from the towns themselves. And I'll show you in another slide how we did it at Red Brook. Um, the Division of Ecological Restoration uh, can do all the permitting. And they can also, you could actually have a, a team leader here in town that would be kind of a, a project manager for the restoration if you decided to go down that. Um, American Rivers is a big recipient of NOAA money uh, that's aimed for restoring these coastal streams. And they're interested in restoring these streams not just for brook trout, but for alewives, uh, blueback herring, American eel, smelt. Um, so there's quite a bit of funding through NOAA, and it flows through American Rivers uh, for uh, dam removal. And then here are some of the other, you know here are some of the other agencies that do that can help in it. So what you do is you start writing grants. Uh, a project leader would start writing grants, and you'd begin to cobble together uh, a way to finance this. But the the concept would be that it would be financed outside of the town, and most of the money coming from federal agencies, federal and state agencies. Um, the interesting thing about removing these dams, as far as brook trout is concerned, is we all thought, well, are these fish going to go back to sea? Because we've had these dams up for on Red Brook for 100 years. So we actually started a study, uh, the group I'm with, uh, the Sea Red Brook Trout Coalition, and UMass, uh, as well as the Mass Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, to do a sonic tag study in Buttermilk Bay to see if these fish would start using the marine environment again. And uh, of course, we had the historical evidence of sea run brook trout in, in Red Brook, but we weren't sure whether removing the dams would allow these fish to kind of cue back into using the marine environment. Um, this is all kind of a rehash of what I've talked about already. Uh, and all of these uh, issues impacted the sea run brook trout. So here you see Red Brook in the yellow circle, and it's a very small stream. It's four and a half miles long. Um, of course, it had a historical salter population. Um, the land went from Theodore Lyman to Trout Unlimited to the trustees of the reservation. The four dams are removed from 2006 to 2009. And then the objectives of this study were to quantify the movements of brook trout uh, in the stream itself, and then down into Buttermilk Bay and see if they'd start utilizing the marine environment again. And the methods are, what we did was we took these Vemco V9 sonic tags, and they're surgically implanted in the, in the fish. Each fish is also given a pit tag, so we can identify each fish. And um, in 2010, we tagged 50 of these trout and these tags are quite expensive. Uh, the, the sonic tags are $350 a piece. So it's a very extensive um, project, but it was also the first time that anybody was looking to see whether these trout would become an adverse again. So it was also a very important study. And uh, here you see up here, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the antenna array. <coughs> So basically what that is, is the fish is given this sonic tag that's surgically implanted in the fish. And then these antennas are set up around the bay. And all the yellow ones here, uh, that's all salt water. The two blue ones are up above. This is, this is Red Brook right up through here. And the two blue ones are in, above head of tide and in the freshwater section. So some uh, are hung from buoys, like this one up here. And then some are sunk down in Buttermilk Bay on a little cement platform like you see there. <coughs> <coughs> and the results from these 50 tags was really very interesting. What we found was um, 19 in individuals <coughs> or 38% were detected between the two blue uh, antennas or going out into the, out into the bay. <coughs> And we had over 25,000 det uh, detections um, from four, and then we had four fish that either died or, uh, or shed their tra uh, transmitters, <coughs> the tags. But we, we actually think they died. Um, 
So here you see all individuals were detected at head of pi, which is number that's that's right there. And then three were detected down in the bay. We'll look at these these fish and see how they moved around. So here you can actually see um, this number up here identifies the fish through its pit tag, and you can see how the fish uh, how the trout come down and start uh, bouncing around the bay. And this is the narrows down here. That's Route 6 right there. So this fish actually uh, went out into Buzzards Bay and hasn't come back yet. It would be interesting to see whether he comes back or uh, maybe he got eaten by a striper. We don't know that. But uh, these fish are using this buttermilk bay much like they'd use uh, your great pond. Um, so they go down there and they what happens is they they grow, they act exactly the opposite of their non-migratory brethren. So they actually grow all winter long when the fish that don't migrate into salt water don't grow at all in the winter time. So it's it's pretty it's an interesting life history adaptation. And here you have another fish uh, that went down. And this fish just seemed to stay right in the mouth of the river. But what's interesting with all these different fishes, uh, after the barriers are removed, they start going back out and using the, uh, the marine environment again. And here you have one fish that just kind of bounces. That's, uh, that's Route 25 up there. That just kind of bounces between this whole section here. But uh, it's given us a really interesting view of, of how these trout react once barriers are moved because it's clear that they start really utilizing the stream a lot more. So the summary for all this is, um, you know, these fish will go back and start using the saltwater environment. Um, what you see right there, that's the marsh at, at, uh, at Red Brook. Uh, we're going to be continuing this into 2012 and 2013. Uh, we tag, tagged an additional 20 fish this past September. And this last slide is just the, uh, what the costs were for the restoration of, of Red Brook. And here you see, this was a, <coughs> excuse me, the largest chunk of money came from American Rivers. But it was first a, a grant from NOAA to American Rivers uh, for the restoration of coastal streams. <coughs> uh, Division of Ecological Restoration put up $62,000. That was for a survey for the entire stream from uh, Century Bogs, which is up by Route 25, all the way down. On uh, a restoration of Mill Brook, it wouldn't be nearly that much. And then AD Makepeace had an in-kind contribution of uh, $50,000. Uh, that was just an in-kind contribution of heavy equipment and operators. Uh, and then you had, from 1990 until uh, 2011, you had roughly 40,000 hours of TU volunteer effort in doing stream restoration. Um, that's one uh, brook trout from Red Brook. You can see how fat he is, that uh, he's had quite a time in the marine environment. He's just come back in from the salt water. Uh, and that, that is typical of, of what a brook trout will do if allowed to go down and, and utilize virtually an unlimited food source uh, down in, in the marine environment. And that's it, folks. Thank you. Uh, these, these are all our partners that are involved in the restoration of uh, all these coastal streams. So it's, uh, it's really a coalition of a lot of different state and federal agencies and then um, the two ENGOs, the two environmental non-government agencies are Trout Unlimited and the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition. Yay. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Um, questions? I see if, okay. Hey, Michael, why don't you yeah. come up front? Yeah. Can someone hit the lights again? Uh, or, I don't know who hit them the first time, but can someone, thank you. <laughs> who is first? Yes, Judy. You said you would mention about the fact that the Great Pond isn't open all the time. Right. How would that affect it? That, uh, it doesn't really affect it because as far as uh, sea trout go, or, or sea run brook trout, 
It doesn't really affect it. So you and Brook Trout really don't venture out into the open.